Do you ever see a successful woman on your feed or in a magazine and think, wow, it must be nice to have it so easy? Well, think again. Behind that glossy cover or smiling face is a ton of hard work, countless failures, and endless learning experiences. I'm Rebecca Minkoff, and I'm here to tell you that success isn't a walk in the park. It takes grit, resilience, and a willingness to take risks. That's why I created Superwoman, a podcast that peels back the varnish and gets into the nitty gritty of what it takes to make it as a woman in today's world. From luminaries and game changers to women you've never heard of but should, this podcast is here to inspire you to take your next leap, no matter how daunting it may seem. We'll explore the sacrifices these women have made, the highs and lows they've experienced, and the lessons they've learned along the way. So if you're ready to be inspired and learn from some of the most successful women out there, join me on Superwomen. Together, we'll uncover the stories behind the successes and prove that with hard work, determination, and a little bit of luck, anything is possible. Hey everyone, you're listening to Superwomen. Today's guest is Ellen Bennett, the founder of the multi-million dollar apron empire, Hedley and Bennett. Her passion for cooking led her to Mexico City at the age of 18, and after culinary school, she came back to L.A. to cook professionally in some of the city's best kitchens. While Ellen was working as a line cook, she volunteered to make aprons to outfit the entire restaurant, and that's where Headley and Bennett was born. Ellen's colorful aprons have amassed a vast following, including David Chang, Martha Stewart, Jessica Alba, Zoe Deschanel, and Jessica Tyler Ferguson, and so many more. I count Ellen as one of my dear friends and was so excited to be able to bring her story to you. She shows grit, determination, and the desire to overcome any obstacle, anytime, anywhere. And her energy is truly infectious. I love this interview. Take a listen. Ellen, welcome. Yay. So happy to see you, lady. I'm happy to see you too. You are coming off of what I viewed as an incredible marathon Filming for four months. Yeah. While pregnant with a baby and running a business. I I bow down. (laughs) I remember my last stretch of work before I was like, put my feet up. And I I just remember being like, holy fuck. I didn't think I could be this exhausted. Totally. It's like a whole other level of exhaustion that I, I finally saw the edge and all of my friends know, like, I don't even know what an edge is. I'm just like, I keep going forever. And I was like, oh, there's the edge. Oh, hey there. (laughs) How's it going? Nice to meet you for the first time. Uh, Yeah, it was, it was quite a bit, but it was, you know what it was? It was like quite a bit emotionally too, because as moms and entrepreneurs, I, we carry around the like, but I'm not at home putting my kid down. Instead, I'm at a shoot organizing someone's kitchen for this show that I have been dreaming about for 13 years. And, and you start to like doubt your dreams a little bit. And then I'd be like, snap out of it. You wanted this. And then I'd be like, yeah. And then I have to like get myself back in the spirit of living the dream that I'm trying to live. Right. So that was like, maybe the wildest part of it was just being in it and not feeling bad about having actually gotten to the place where I got to do the thing that I've wanted to do forever and not feeling, you know, like I should be anywhere else but that. You know, it's a really hard place to be. I feel like I'm staring that in the, in the, what is it? The barrel. I'm going to be filming something for the next three months. And they gave me the schedule today. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to see my children. And I already am upset and want to cry because I'm just like, am I making the wrong decision? You know, which is, it's a wild, it's a wild feeling. And I don't know that there's a right answer, which is. Yeah, no. And and the truth is like, Mm -hmm. you are doing something for the long game, but in that moment, it feels really rough. And in the short game, you're like, this is wrong. And in the end, I was like, you know what, this is going to help on so many levels. And it's something I've always wanted to do. And I've like manifested it. Like I put it out there into the world such a long time ago. And I finally had it come true. Everyone's like, what are they talking about? I'm filming a show about kitchen design and it's all through the lens of a chef. And my background is Headley and Bennett, which is a company that makes culinary gear for restaurants and chefs. And I've been doing that for 11 years. So for 11 years, I've been like psychotically studying and involved with the restaurant industry. And before that I was a chef myself. So it's like, 
my whole life in a way has been leading up to this moment where I had enough knowledge, experience, insight in all the nerdy things that chefs need in a kitchen and now have the ability to like go into someone's home and change their home forever through the lens of functionality and then making it look good. So it's like not an HGTV show that's just like, boom, your kitchen looks great and your cabinets don't work. Bye. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> like the polar opposite. It's like, where do you stand? How many people are you feeding every week? Are you entertaining a lot? Why do you have 42 platters? We're going to trim that down to 10 because you only have six cabinets. Like so dorky and amazing. And our entire crew has been like remodeling their kitchen while we do this because they're so inspired. So like that is what I'm doing, but I've also had to not be as present at Headley and Bennett. I've had to leave my two-year-old with my husband and my nanny a lot of days. In fact, yesterday, Sunday, I was gone all day because it was our last day of shooting. And every time, Rebecca, every time I feel shitty, like I feel a little angst of guilt and I have to just like shut it down because a dude wouldn't do that. He'd be right. like, hell yeah, I'm living my dream. And then I'm going to do something that's going to help my family. And and sometimes I feel like I just have to be a little less emotional about it. To yeah. Get yeah, I know. It's almost like you have to not numb yourself, but just like you said, a dude wouldn't think twice. Yeah. And hell yeah, if I can do this and it will help my family and my business and myself and I accomplish a goal that I've wanted for such a long time, like I should feel no shame in that period, full stop. And so it's taken like four months and a lot of conversations with myself and a lot of lap swimming to get to the other side and be like, it's OK, you're doing the right things. Wow. I'm glad you got there because, um, yeah, I I've been there and I'm about to be there again. And it's, it's, it's a discussion that a lot of women probably are just like, is there ever an answer? So I'm glad you were honest about that. Yeah. Um, let's go back to your chef days. Yes. And then we'll get into Hedley and Bennett and then the future. Um, so did you always like cooking growing up or who inspired you to be one of make yeah. delicious food, which I have been the proud recipient when you have a baby, if you're friends with Ellen, she comes to your house, she cooks you a fucking meal that's like leftovers for days. Thank you. And she <laughs> sends you a free to baby kit so that your vagina is so well taken care of. Oh, the vagina. It's so she's a good friend to have. <laughs> I will always send you Frida and uh, take care of the vagina and food. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, so I'm 36 and I can remember first starting to cook with my abuelita, who's my Mexican grandma, when I was like, I think three or four, like tiny. And I always loved it. And I was such a weirdo. I never wanted to hang out with my actual friends. I was in their kitchens with their abuelitas and their moms being like, what is that? What's that flavor? What's that chili? What's that this? And I spent a lot of time in Mexico when I was little with my abuelita and visiting my friends. And it was just such a different like cultural experience. And everybody was, it didn't matter if they had a fancy kitchen or it was like a shack. They were all hanging out in the kitchen always. And I loved that. So I just kind of decided early on that was going to be a part of my life somehow. And I didn't know what it would look like, but I knew that it was food. And I just kind of like kept following that little spaghetti down the road and eventually um, moved to Mexico City, went to culinary school there, lived there for four years. And then I had this whole wonderful life in Mexico. And I was like, I'm 22 years old. This can't be it. I'm going to return to the States. So I moved back in with my mother, which was like, oh my God, sticker shock. <laughs> <laughs> to like live this grand life by myself earning my own money, paying my way through school, ha didn't have any contacts when I got to Mexico and left with like a whole life to then return to your mother's house is like quite. You must, quite have, you must have seen the vision really clearly because that that doesn't sound like you're like, <laughs> this is it. And then you're like, actually, let me go back a couple steps. Oh my gosh, totally. And of course, my mom still treated me like I was the 18 year old that had left four years ago uh, as, as any proper Latin mother would. And I had to just suck it up because I knew I couldn't afford to get my own apartment and all that stuff. I needed to get a job in a professional kitchen. Um, so I went and like stormed into 10 restaurants in LA, the top 10, and two of them gave me offers. And how, how did you do that? You stormed in like, in like, take us through those door. moments. You to went the back to the door. back door. Yeah. Yeah. And you said, I'll do anything or what? 
Uh, yeah, pretty much. I like sort of halfway invented a resume. I mean, I had had some experience, but nothing really epic. And you typically would get somebody to email or recommend you or refer you. And all I knew to do in Mexico was like show up try and get the opportunity to become your opportunity. And so I just sort of used that same muscle that I had used in Mexico to land so many different jobs that I skimmed over. We can talk about them, but if you want. Um, but yeah, so I like walked in through the back door. I found a bus boy. He spoke Spanish and I was like, tell me where the chef is. I want to talk to him. And he kind of like threw me in the kitchen and then I would turn around. They'd be gone. <laughs> They're like, I don't want any responsibility with having her gotten her into the building. But uh, here she is. And uh, I just was like, I'm a, I'm a cook. I love your food. Your restaurant's amazing. I hadn't eaten at any of them. I was like totally pulling this out of my ass. And I was like, I want the opportunity to work and I'm Mexican and I have the work ethic to prove it. And they were like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I'm like standing in a dress and they're just not the outfit you go with to apply for a line cook job. And um, anyway, two of them said yes. And the other eight looked at me like I was out of my fucking mind. And uh, it's a good ratio to know in your head when you're trying to get something. That's like kind of the ratio. You want some sales, make 10 calls and probably two people will answer and everyone else will say fuck off. So I've always like had that in my mind, like two to 10. That's the volume, the output that you need to get for the input you want. And I took both jobs. I was like, great. I'll work some days with you and I'll work some days with the other one. And I didn't tell either. And I just took both jobs. <laughs> And they hired you on the spot. They didn't say this stranger showed up in my kitchen and here you, here's your job. No, no, no. They actually made me come in and do like a tryout, which in restaurant land, they call staging. So it's like a practice run. Yeah. And it's not practice. They literally throw you into the line of fire. Like they're like, great, come work Friday night on the line, which is where everything is being cooked. So I did that. And then I was hired on the spot at the end of that night. Wow. Uh, Lazy Ox, which was one restaurant. And then the other one, which was a two Michelin star restaurant. I went up to the chef and I was like, so how did I do? Um, you know, will you, you, do I get a job? And he was like, we're not even hiring. And I thought, holy shit, I went through all that and they're not even hiring. But my pinky was already jammed in the door. And I, in like this split second of like, what do I do? What do I do? I can't believe they just said no. I was like, don't worry about it. Just let me keep coming and I'll keep working for free. And, you know, I just want to learn from you guys. And he was like, okay, fine. And then two weeks later, I was at the farmer's market with him because I had hustled my way into going grocery shopping with them for the restaurant, grocery shopping, AKA going to the farmer's market. And, uh, you know, cooks that are stages don't necessarily do that. They're like, they show up at the time they clock in, they show up, but then then they leave. And I was just like so excited to learn that I just would find any opportunity to go there. And so I'm walking around the market with him and he's like, how fast can you quit your other job? And I was like, when do you want me to start? And he's like, tomorrow. And I said, deal. <laughs> and, and then I, that was how I got my job at a two Michelin star restaurant, which was wild because I couldn't afford to go to the culinary school that all the kids under me at the restaurant eventually came from. It was like this beautiful school in New York called CIA. And I think it was like 60,000 a year. Like it was so expensive. And these poor guys had, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and they were making $10 an hour, just like me. And I couldn't believe it that I was like somehow overseeing their area, but I had gotten in through a very unconventional way. So it's, it's a reminder, like no path is only one path. Like there's so many ways to get to something that you want. And I took a very unconventional move to Mexico, live on my own, hustle my way into my mother's house, go get a job through the back door way. But that is a possibility. <laughs> Just remember wow. that. Did you ever ask him like, what made you take a chance on me? Like a stranger literally showed up at the back door to like a restaurant where I only know Michelin star restaurants from TV, but they yeah. seem like the chefs are there to be revered and feared you know, in these, in every single Netflix special that I watch. And so like, I can't imagine their reaction to like this girl off the street. So did he ever say, Ellen, I chose you because? You know, we did this a kind of Headley and Bennett, OG, or like we did a, how do I explain it? We did this like thing where we brought in all the OG chefs into Headley and Bennett to do a, a photo shoot and a whole session on them. And 
did a video with them. And he was like, you know, I just remember you because <laughs> I had hustled my way into many things after that with him. And in the video, he mentions how I walked around this event that I had convinced him to bring me to. And I put an apron around the neck of every single chef there and none of them knew who I was. And he's like, and I looked around and I was just like, oh my God, she just did that. And I think that was just the constant through line with me and him and this restaurant is that I would just show up and relentlessly want to do things and then ask for them. And he is such an amazing leader. I've seen him give people opportunities that you would never think would get an opportunity with him just because they asked and they showed up and then they proved that they could like his dishwasher became the main guy that cuts all the fish. And we spend thousands of dollars weekly ordering fish from Japan. So it's not just like, oh, great, you got a bunch of fish. No big deal. Like that is the most revered job almost in a restaurant like that. And he taught him how to cut all the fish after being the dishwasher. So this guy clearly doesn't care what your background is or where you come from. He just wants to know, do you have the work ethic? And I think I aligned with his principles on that. Wow. So then what gave you, how long did you work as a cook or chef mm -hmm. um, before cook. you said, huh? Cook is right. No one oh, actually huh? calls them like themselves a chef unless they're, I don't know. It's a weird thing. I know my friend Eden feels the same way. She's like, I'm a cook, not a chef. I'm like, but you're why? I know. I know. It's like a weird psychological thing. I don't know. You just call yourself a cook because you're always learning. A chef okay. is like, he's peaked okay. and a cook always learns. Okay, but fine. I, I worked there for two years. And then somewhere in that journey, I started doing the Headley and Bennett thing at the restaurant um, very much on the side. I just like had the idea in my head. And then there was another cook who was like, that's pretty cool. Like, let's talk about it. And, and then at the other restaurant, I worked at the chef one day, this was like all within, think about it in like a month, I put it in my brain and it just kind of like existed and floated around in there. And then within a month, the other chef was like, Hey, there's a girl, she's going to make us aprons for the restaurant. Do you want to buy one? And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like I had this up here and now you're telling me that you're paying somebody else. And I, in Ellen Bennett fashion, I was like, chef, I have an apron company. I'll make you those aprons. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like you're a cook in my kitchen. And I convinced him on the spot to give me this order of 40 aprons. And that's effectively how Headley and Bennett started. Um, and at that time, it's not like you knew where to go, how to buy it, where to get a made. None, like literally none of it. I didn't even have a sewer and I don't know how to sew, but I knew that I could land the plane because I had done enough crazy shit <laughs> that I was like, okay, I can figure this out. And I was very passionate about, like, I really, really had a purpose for it. It wasn't just like, oh, cool aprons. I was like, no, we have to change the way people feel and look in the kim in the kitchen. And we're going to bring confidence and we're going to make people feel valued. And it was this like big deal for me. So I put so much importance and weight on it that I was just like, fine, I'm going to figure it out. And, and, and I did. And he gave me that order and I clocked out and I went and hunted around LA for sewers and people that could help me. And it was like a wild goose chase. But when you're wild goose chasing something you love, as I know you've gone through the same journey with Red Back, I mean, if you just kind of like figure it out. Yeah. Are, do you have enough tenacity to just keep opening doors that have no path <laughs> and then being like, all right, that didn't work. Let me close that door and go to the next door and see, oh, there's no door. Let me climb into a fucking window. Yep. Yep. You, just you know, it's funny oh. as you, as you tell me this story, I'm like, oh, I'm cringing, but I did the same thing. I didn't know where to get a bag made. And I was like, you know, I'm going to I mean, figure it out. So Becky, I remember when your bags first came out, it was like, the Becky bag. And in the same way that people with Headley and Bennett would be like, Ooh, do you know Ellen, the apron lady? It had to be like somebody needed to connect you with Becky through text to get a bag. And it was so like exclusive and oh, kind of man. like under the radar, but it made it so covetable. I totally remember that. It was like the early 2000s. Is that 2005, right? dude. Yeah. 
I started Heavenly Manna in 2012. But yes, I remember that. I remember oh coming back from Mexico and I was just like, damn, those bags seem sick. And then I got one and I was like, yes. And you felt <laughs> so cool and so proud. And it was just, it was the best. It, it was green and brown. I remember. I still remember. Oh my God. I know that one. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great yeah. bag. Oh, I love that. Um, okay. So you launched the company. You're working two jobs at that point. Yeah. Well, okay. three really, because I was also a personal chef for a family in the morning. Oh, no big deal. If you were to tell me you had a baby during this time, I would just end the podcast and say, we can all give up. We have an overachiever and no one is going to do this. But I know you didn't have a baby yet. I did not um, have a child. My life and my whole world and my baby was heavily in Bennett for sure. Yes. Okay. So you were a personal chef, two jobs, Headley and Bennett. How did you sort of manage all of that at once or I not? Did. Okay. I didn't. I uh, I definitely had many freakouts all the time. I didn't know what I was doing. I very much uh, didn't have any business experience. And honestly, I failed more than I succeeded a lot. And And what I mean by that is I would, you know, I had everything from like ordering the wrong fabrics and having it shrink and spending half my savings on the fabric that I ordered that was the wrong fabric, but I hadn't thought through shrinkage and details like that early on, or I'd hire a sewer and be like, oh, you seem great. And because I wanted to be like my chef, Michael Simarusti, like everyone is, everyone is great and everyone is going to work hard for you. And that just wasn't true. And that really hurt. And I felt like my husband and I had just gotten together then. He wasn't my husband. He was just my boyfriend. And he remembers me saying like, well, you know, 95% of the time you'll nail it. 5% of the time you won't. And I mean, I don't think I've said that in seven years, but early on, I was just like, so fucking optimistic. Like nothing could shoot me down. And then it was just like, like, you know, <laughs> machine guns to my wings for like six years. And I was like, oh my God, I just, I don't know. I sort of assumed that everything would always align. And I think that optimism did carry me far, but it also grounded me in the reality that I needed to like do my fucking homework sometimes. And I couldn't just land the plane miraculously every time. Like I actually had to lean into the details and figure it out. And, you know, I wrote a book called dream first details later. And that was like my fucking life motto. Like I just would show up and figure it out. And, and it got me really far until I realized my dreams had gotten so big that I needed to focus on some details. And that was right. a big ass learning curve for an optimistic, young, sprightly lady like myself when I was 24, 25. What was that moment where you got that slap in the face? You're like, oh, I'm getting too big to like, just figure it out on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. Just like glow it all into existence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a series of things. It wasn't like one particular moment, but I would say, you know, I will never forget. I was, oh God, I think I was like six years into the journey and we had moved into this big building. It was like 16,000 square feet. We could not afford it, but I knew that in the long game, we would need all that space. So I ended up subletting part of the building so that I could have the whole building, but people could help me, you know, pay for it. And we had gotten ourselves into so much debt, remodeling it, paying the down payment, all this stuff. And um, the guy that sublet it from me was the person that they gave the lease to because I was young and a woman. And I would pay him the rent and then he would pay the landlady. And he, I guess, was filing for bankruptcy, didn't say anything. It was like keeping our rent. And so I um, I found out because I got served an eviction notice. And this was at the early stage of the summer. And as you know, Q4 is like the most intense and important part of a business like ours, where you make most of your money at the end of the year. And so, um, yeah, I just had this like, very major come to Jesus moment of like, if I don't figure out how to pay for all the back rent that this guy is now stolen, plus all of the down payments so that I can get the building and convince this lady to now give me the entire lease. Like, 
we're kind of screwed because we don't have time to relocate 16,000 square feet of shit to somewhere else before holiday. And the only money I had was money for inventory for holiday. So I took that money and I paid it back. I think I loaned the business money. I had like a little bit of savings from random shit I'd been saving up on. And, uh, and then I, this is the part that actually is like the most painful. I sat on the phone with my bookkeeper who's still with me to this day. And we called American Express for a line, like a credit line extension. And we sat on hold. It was like eight o'clock at night at the factory. The factory was freezing and it was this dingy little room. And we just sat there looking at each other while this bullshit Amex music played in the background, just horrible. <laughs> and we, we were like, what's going to happen? And they uh, answered the phone. They're like, we're so sorry, Miss Bennett. Like we cannot extend your line of credit. Have a nice night. And then it was over. And we were just like, what the fuck do we do? And um, yeah. And then I had to just like pull the money from inventory, pull the money from my own bank accounts and like scrap it all together. But it was such a close call, Becky, like such a close call. I mean, we were making aprons and shipping them same day up until like six days before Christmas, like psychotically taking orders. And we shouldn't, you know, that's just not how you run a business. Um, so like that is just one of a billion times that it was so dark. And and yet people see my Instagram and they look at Headley Man and they're like, but it's so colorful and bright and you look like you're doing amazing all the time. And it's just like, yeah, and that's actually true. I am doing amazing, but I also have really fucking hard times. Yeah. And you don't have to be doing, you don't have to be like doing amazing or have really hard times to only do one. Like you can have both. That is the journey of life and business. But yeah, that was- Oh my so gosh, that just <laughs> makes me want to puke. <laughs> I know. Every time I like recount it, it makes me want to puke too. Just being so close to the edge and then- still persevering forward you're like yeah. no one in their right mind would keep going after this and yet I was like see you tomorrow <laughs> like the fuck I mean I tell so many women sometimes the only thing that it determines your success is that you just kept going and everyone else gave up everyone else was like tapping out don't like but, this uncomfortable you know what's funny is that throughout my very like slowly but surely journey. Like I felt and looked like a turtle compared to a lot of these brands. This was in the heyday of Warby Parker and all these huge companies raising tons and tons of money at massive valuations and the direct to consumer world just skyrocketing. And we were this small business that had a big brand, but financially we were not making nearly as much money as it might've seemed like we were. And that was really kind of hard because I had to put my blinders on and just be like, it's okay. We're on our own path. Like we are, we don't have investors. We're self-funding this. We're focused on profitability. And yet then at some point we got into debt and then had to climb out of that. And it was just like, it was scary to not go and do what everyone else was doing. Yeah. When that was happening around, like that was the cool thing to do. It was like, well, are you happy now? Cause everything there is imploding imploding yeah and we're like totally profitable we're growing a ton and it's but it took us kind of 11 years to be right about that yeah. like forever people were like what are you doing just like right. go get the money and blow this thing up and I I just I don't know I didn't I didn't feel like that was the right path for us so yeah yeah so you started with aprons. Tell me about product extensions and kind of where you're going now. Cause I know when we start, before we started recording, you said there's expansion taking place, but I'm curious yeah. what your vision is. Yeah. Well, after I, after COVID happened or in the middle of COVID, like Headley and Bennett radically shifted to becoming very much online. And that was a huge push that occurred because we kind of had to, it was either like evolve or die. Right. Yep. Um, and because a lot of our business had been in restaurant land and then restaurant land, you know, got punched in the face through COVID, we adapted to online. We did this huge mask initiative and we just moved towards a different, a different world. And we created a lot of efficiencies. So we might've had a million different fabrics before. And then in COVID we're like, nope, we're trimming it down. Less is more focus on a few great things, scale it up and don't buy a million SKUs just because you can. And we did this thing called like cutting the long tail. 
And what that meant was like most of the money we were making was happening with like a few SKUs and then everything else was a long tail. It was like this purse sells this many bags. This one sells two bags. 80, this 20, one sells baby. one bag. 80, 20. And it was on the nose. And so we essentially like cut the long tail of all of those SKUs that were tying up our dollars and our money and our energy and focused on a lot less, but a lot deeper. And it like totally radically shifted the business for us. So we started doing that. And then it was like, okay, we, what, what beyond aprons? And we'd have our chef community telling us forever, like, we'd love to see knives from you. We'd love to see all these other things. And so we had this running list and we started working on product development all through COVID. Um, and now we have launched our knives as of like a year and a half ago we have the and they're beautiful Japanese steel designed with chefs in our community so like nothing just looks good it's actually really fucking strong beautiful material that's pro grade and that's like our motto just because we're making it for your house doesn't mean it's not going to be pro grade it's actually pro grade and it works in restaurants but it also looks pretty in your house so we did knives cutting boards, a whole line of kitchen linens, smocks that are like a little bit more feminine cross back aprons. And um, we're about to launch kitchen tools. So we'll have a full suite, like everything you have in your kitchen drawer that looks like shit and nothing matches and nothing works and it's really long and it's half burnt. You're going to throw it all away and you're going to replace it with Headley and Bennett's full kitchen tool set. Wow. And that's that's been like a really big one because- it's such a pain point for people. Like they just don't have the right materials and the tools. Yeah. And yet you think about how much money we spend on a beauty cabinet, right? Like all the shit you put on your face yeah. and the things you have to take care of your outside body. But then the things you're putting in your body, like the tools to make that food all suck and they're like crappy and they're peeling toxic materials off of the plates. You know, it's just like bad or the the pans so we just streamlined all of it and so that's wow. about it. wow so all of that is incredibly expensive to make yes, very. and um takes up space so I'm curious how you sort of thought through the risk of all that um yeah, yeah I guess yeah. the risk of, of doing all that yeah, it was it was definitely a big risk and it's a it's a huge leap when you've done something that is now your comfort zone, right? Aprons have become our comfort zone and we could have done that forever. But I knew that to evolve and to grow, we needed to continue to offer our our whole world like more things that actually help them and create this efficiency that we are always talking about, right? We want to create confidence and creativity in the kitchen. Like that is our motto as a business. And to do that, you need the full arsenal of stuff Mm -hmm. And just the apron isn't cutting it anymore. And so we just basically decided to place some bets and we chose a few horses and we set money aside and we went after those horses. The first horse was knives and it, it was like slowly, but surely it wasn't like radical success right off the gate, but friendly reminder, neither were the aprons. Like it took years for people to be like, oh my God, that ampersand that I see on top chef and this and that. That wasn't like at the beginning, people knew it. And I just, when I get doubtful, I think about the long game. So we did the knife. Yeah. No, I just want to underline that it didn't happen overnight because I think people, again, they see something on Instagram, like this thing sold out overnight. And you're just like, oh, that's how it has to be for me. And like, I'm always reminding myself when I launch something new, I'm like, it's not going to sell out overnight. It's not going to be the home run. It's like, like you said, slow and steady. Slow and steady. Yeah. So the slow and steady tactic has really worked because what we do is launch it, get it to market and then adjust and edit and adapt. And it's a, it's a happy balance, right? Cause we're so psychotic about quality that we need to make sure that the product is amazing. I'm like literally sitting here. I don't know why there's knives on my counter, but there are, here's one of them. This is our bread knife and here's our chef's knife. It's like used, but, um, Anyway, like we did, we were spent so much time on it, but at some point we had to call it and be like, it's ready for market, like yeah. send it, ship it off. And then we listened to our customers and they'd be like, this is amazing. You know, maybe tweak this on the packaging or fix that. And, and we really leaned into that um, in the same way I leaned into it when I first started making aprons. And by like listening after you launch, 
and adapting quickly, you can make an even better product and do, then do a 2.0 versus spending eight years on it and making it so perfect that it's like obsolete by the time you launch it because you spent so much time on it. Um, so it was a lot of that. And, and then that one worked, but I'll tell you, there were, you know, there's been other things that we've launched, like certain collaborations that I won't name names, but like, you'd think this is going to blow it out of the water and it didn't. And then everyone's like, what happened? I thought this was going to be the biggest thing we'd ever done. And then we'd launch like a tiny collaboration with a smaller company and that one kills it. So you just, you literally don't know. You got to like put it in front of your audience and then see what happens and be thoughtful about the inventory. That is honestly one of the biggest learnings learnings we've had. Like just because you feel bullish about it doesn't mean you need to go buy 10,000 units of it. Like start small. If it sells out, fine. Buy back more into it. Put it on pre-sale. Do all the things that like streetwear does now where it's just like, it sells out, it's gone. Okay, pre-sale. Okay, it's coming, it ships in a month. Like people have been, you know, kind of groomed into waiting longer than they used to. And we just used to be so afraid of selling out that we'd buy into crazy amounts and we just don't do that anymore. Yeah. I remember uh, with a prior president, like we had at one point, I don't remember, I think it was like $20 million of excess inventory at all times, just in case, you know, and then we trimmed it down to like three or four, but it, and that's what is normal. Um, But I just go, you know what? I so agree with you about being as lean as possible inventory wise and great. If you sell out, it just creates more FOMO and I must have it the next time. That's right. Yeah. But that took a long, I mean, I'm talking like it took 10 years to realize that. So Whoever is listening, just know it is okay to have smaller inventory. It is okay to have a smaller team. You don't need, for a long time, just to touch on that team front, for a long time, I thought I needed to have like 50, 100, 200 employees to be quote unquote successful. And now I've realized it's like, no, to be successful is to have the right people on the bus and have them in the right seats and to have the company growing profitably at a decent clip. Like, 15, 20, 30% happy with that. Like that is just like, it's steady, it's constant. If you are profitable repeatedly, it compounds, right? But like going from a 100% to 200% to 300% growth year over year and maintaining that is kind of how a lot of these direct-to-consumer companies have gotten themselves into pickles. And I'm not gonna lie, our team is very excited when we hit 50 or 75% growth year over year but you just have to be realistic about like, how are you getting that growth? And is that growth real? Yeah. And you maintain it. And again, back to the amount of people on the team, I've had plenty of people on the team and the company has been less successful than when I've had less people on the team that are the right people. So we just have these like fake ideas that we gather from the world because you see other people being like, here I am with my 200 employees and look how happy I am. And you just don't know what's happening behind the screen, behind the scenes on that. Yep. So do you feel like being a month out from baby number two, which can be a game changer for most people? Cause, um, there's another, there's another human, like, are you making changes to how you approach work, personal life? You shoot, you have a show coming out. When does the show come out? May 28th, May 28th. Okay. So you've done the hard work of shooting it, but then there's promotion and all the fun stuff. So how have you sort of said, okay, this is how I'm going to approach this baby, my business, TV, and like, what's your view of that? Yeah. I'm 100% positive you went through this journey too, and you've probably gone through it more than I have because I'm only on number two. But I definitely feel like I had a existential identity crisis between baby one and now, or from zero to one. I was like, who am I? How do I show up in the world? What does this mean? Who is the Ellen of before? And how is the Ellen of now? And where'd she, where'd she go? And in a way, I kind of had to like grieve parts of me that I knew I wasn't going back to because I just frankly didn't want to go back to them. And then I realized it was like a success. I, I didn't need to go to every event and every party and every wedding because I didn't actually care as much anymore. And I was a different version of myself. And then as life kept going and I finished breastfeeding and doing all the things that like consume your every waking moment and, and soul, I, um, I was like, okay, okay. I have more time now. (laughs) Like, what does this mean? What do I do with that time? And I definitely 
shifted my priorities to bigger things than I had before. And that was a pretty big deal for me. So it was a success in a way to say, okay, cool. I'm not like Ellen pre-baby. I'm Ellen post-baby and it's evolving. And now that I'm going into round two, I don't think that identity shift is going to change. It's just going to keep happening at like a larger scale. Um, But I would say the orientation towards my family has radically skyrocketed. Like it's really important. It's just so important. And then I definitely have decided like I need to put more time into relationships that I love and not just bladder myself to everybody because I want to be friends with everyone. Right. And that was for a long time because I was so busy building community and meeting so many people for Headley and Bennett. That was my number one goal was just like make as many friends as possible and help people as much as possible. And I'm now like 36 with two kids and a limited amount of time. And yeah. so I'm like, all right, I need to prioritize, you know, those people don't make me feel great. And and we don't really connect over anything, but a specific couple topics. So maybe I don't spend as much time with them. That's Let's a really, really hard one. I, I'm gonna like, <laughs> I feel like I'm still going through it. And I, and I found myself being like the same as you, like something's got to give and it can't be yeah. the acquaintances. But, and then I'm like, I don't know. Like I have all these like, oh, we were friends. And then I couldn't keep that one up and I couldn't keep her up and I couldn't keep her up. And look, we could have been doing that with them. And it just like, it can drive you crazy. It totally can. And and it will. And sometimes it still does. And and of course, good old social media will make you feel FOMO when other people are feeling like your life is their FOMO and it's so fucked up. And you just got to remember, like everyone has those feelings and and you're going to be okay if you didn't go to that damn event. Like it goes, the FOMO goes away eventually. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a struggle. It's definitely something that I'm, I'm just, I try to not worry about it as much. And, and then know that if I get out of work early and I get to run home and put Nico down for bedtime, like that fills my cup because it is the long game. And I know that if I'm like, filling up the marbles in my bowl of motherhood with him. Now in the long game, this boy is going to be awesome and amazing and loved. And one day love his wife or, you know, partner a lot. And that's awesome to me. So that's the, that's the like shift that I'm going through for sure. Um, But I also on the hard part of it, you know, I stepped down from being the CEO when I had Nico and I brought on people that are, very, very, very educated and from very fancy schools into my company. And there's definitely times when I'm like, I don't actually understand what they're talking about. And I need to ask dumb questions and I need to lean into all kinds of discomforts that I am not happy about. And I want to know everything. And yet I don't. And um, I'm also not as present because I have Nico and because I'm doing the show and so it's a tug and a pull and, and I don't have all the answers and I do struggle with it. And, um, a lot of people are like, I want to be like you when I grow up. And I'm like, no, you're just going to be your best version of yourself when you grow up and not me because I'm on my own wild journey with all yeah. my own wild bullshit along the way. Like I have my baggage too. You know, we yeah. all do, even if social media makes you think that no one has baggage and that everyone has perfect skin, it's bullshit. <laughs> I have wrinkles and gray hair. <laughs> There's gray hair. I climbed out of bed not a long time ago because I was so tired. Like this is. Oh, I life. love you. I love you. I love how honest you're being. I think it's so needed. Um, and I would talk to you forever. Um, <laughs> but I want to give you some some time to decompress. Time to take a nap. Time. Yes. So before we wrap, best piece of advice you've ever been given or learned the hard way, and what would we be surprised to know about you? Ooh. Okay. Um honestly, the best piece of advice I've ever gotten, I really do think is just show up. Just show up. Like when in doubt, just fucking show up. Seriously. That's still like anything, right? That's like the pool to the gym, to the appointment you don't want to take to the sales call that you didn't feel comfortable about, but you're going to do it anyway. Just show up. And then one thing that would surprise you about me. um, That you're a seal. Seal. You're a swimmer, like a Navy Seal or like the animal. 
you are a both because I see you swimming and you're, I'm like, how is she swimming? She's yes. just a seal in love. You're like so smooth and slick. Like, it's like crazy. You're like a water animal versus a human. I mean, it's like you've been I'm swimming beaver. professionally your whole life. <laughs> Becky, I'm a beaver. I never told you, but I'm a beaver. Um, Miko would be, my son would be very excited about that. Yes, I am a swimmer and I lap swim to basically pull my shit together weekly. I wow. do like 45 minutes to an hour just by myself at the pool or with my 60 year old neighbor who also loves to lap. So I'll pick him up and we'll go to the pool. And I love it. And having, having something like that, that just keeps you grounded is pretty fucking important, especially if it has a little bit of exercise. And I did get myself into the master's swim program while I went, while I've been pregnant, but I decided it was maybe a little bit of a stretch to be oh, working thank you. 6 a.m. six days a week while being pregnant on the show. So I, I drew the line. So did my husband. He was Your like, baby's literally going to swim out of you. I read somewhere <laughs> that like women who swim, like have the easiest labors. So I'm, I'm, oh my God, please from your mouth to God's ears, but make <laughs> that happen. I'm like, okay, I don't really want to do another 40 hour labor, please. No, please. I don't, I doubt it with the, no, not with all the swimming. <laughs> um, so where can everyone find you, buy you, support you, follow you, yes. all the things? Well, definitely go and follow Headley and Bennett on our Instagram. Go to our website, headleyandbennett.com. I have a pass, I have a discount code. It's Ellen20, E-L-L-E-N 20. So everyone can step up their knife game. I bet your knives suck. So go replace them with Chef Grade Knives. Hello. And an apron and kitchen tools and everything else. And then mine is Ellen Marie Bennett on Instagram as well. And I love posting about my kids and my life and all the things. And it's pretty honest. So, you know, if you want more honest DNF bombs, go to my Ellen Marie Bennett <laughs> Instagram. I love you. I love, I you. love Thank you. you for doing this. I oh will God. not see you soon, but I hope to be in LA and I'll come visit you and that baby. Okay, deal. Love you. Okay. I just wanted to thank you guys for listening to today's episode. I also want to ask you to rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a pain in the butt, but it actually helps with search and algorithm. So if you love this podcast, it is an easy way to get it more visible and out there. I also want you to follow me on Instagram at Rebecca Minkoff at RM Superwomen and be sure to check out my book, Fearless, The New Rules for Unlocking Creativity, Courage, and Success. Thank you again, and you will hear from me next week.